Morris. In an interview during his time at Rikers, Tupac had this to say. Well, the first two days in prison I had to go through what life is like when you've been smoking weed for as long as I have and then you stop. Emotionally, it was like I didn't know myself. I was sitting in a room, like there was two people in the room, evil and good. That was the hardest part. After that, the weed was out of me. Then I started doing like a thousand push-ups for myself every day. I was reading whole books in one day and writing, and that was putting me in a peace of mind. Then I started seeing my situation and what got me here. Even though I'm innocent of the charge they gave me, I'm not innocent in terms of the way I was acting. I'm just as guilty for not doing nothing as I am for doing things. Not with this case, but just in my life. I had a job to do and I never showed up. I was so scared of this responsibility that I was running away from it. But I see now that whether I show up for work or not, the evil forces are going to be at me. They're going to come 100%, so if I don't be 100% pure-hearted, I'm going to lose. And that's why I'm losing. When I got in here, all the prisoners was like, fuck that gangster rapper. I'm not a gangster rapper. I rap about things that happened to me. I got shot five times, you know what I'm saying? People was really trying to kill me. It was really real like that. I don't see myself being special. I just see myself having more responsibilities than the next man. People looked to me to do things for them, to have answers. I wasn't having answers because my brain was half dead from smoking so much weed. I'd be in my hotel room smoking too much, drinking, going to clubs, just being numb. That was being in jail to me. I wasn't happy at all on the streets. Nobody could say they saw me happy. The addict in Tupac is dead. The excuse maker in Tupac is dead. The vengeful Tupac is dead. The Tupac that would stand by and let dishonorable things happen is dead. God let me live for me to do something extremely extraordinary. And that's what I have to do. Even if they give me the maximum sentence, that's still my job. It was during his Rikers time when Pac also publicly implicated Biggie, Puffy, Andre Harrell, and his close friend Stretch in the recording studio ambush. Naturally, Andre Harrell, Biggie, and Combs gave their own interviews denying any and all allegations. However, Pac's friend Stretch was found murdered, execution style, on the one year anniversary of the 1994 shooting in November 1995. At the same time, the East-West rift in the hip-hop community was widening. While the East Coast rappers watched the West Coast albums rise sharply in mainstream popularity, a number of players in the music community lamented the West Coast rappers' violent and misogynistic lyrics. And other old-school New York rappers complained that the West was ruining the art form, scolding them for what they thought was an overuse of sampling. Since Tupac hailed from both coasts, he was potentially stuck in the middle of it. But even though Pac felt the East Crew's statements disrespected the accomplishments made by the West Coast pioneers, he preferred to leave it at that. They were just two schools of musical thought with a difference of opinion. Live and let live, so to speak. Tupac went on to serve eight months of his sentence before death row's Suge Knight and his lawyers engineered a deal to release Tupac on a $1.4 million bond pending his appeal. Now out of jail, Tupac again went straight to the studio. Unfortunately, his Thug Life crew disbanded. So Tupac turned to Dr. Dre. In February of 1996, Pac made ways by suggesting he'd been sleeping with Biggie's wife, Faith Evans. Evans denied it. Later that month, Tupac dropped All Eyes on Me, the first ever hip-hop double album. Topping both the R&B and pop charts, the CD sold an amazing 5 million copies by April. The Dr. Dre produced lead single on the album, California Love, was a club banger that let everybody know Tupac was back. However, it also brought the New York-born rapper more heat from the East, including resentment at Pac's apparent allegiance to the West Coast. Pac didn't agree that the allegiance was new, and in any case, it was his own business. Having been living in Cali for years, Pac saw I was showing his love for the cities and state he lived in. Tupac unloaded his frustrations into scathing lyrics, which included his usually eloquent musings on death, as well as what seemed to some people like paranoid delusions. Through all of this, 
Tupac felt his poetry was rooted in the same issues that old school hip hop voiced, though not everyone understood that. One month after Tupac released All Eyes on Me, East literally battled West, as members of Death Row and Bad Boy Records faced off. After the Soul Train Awards in Los Angeles, members from both entourages exchanged words, and at least one person pulled a gun. By April of 1996, All Eyes on Me had gone quintuple platinum, and Tupac would soon head back to the Slammer to sit out a new four-month sentence for refusing to do the road cleanup work that was part of his original parole. But for the moment, Tupac and Snoop were on set, filming the video for Two of America's Most Wanted, with Tupac directing. In an interview, the duo had a few things to say about the video. Said Tupac, The video was just as much a Snoop video as it is mine. We all move as one, because Death Row, we really like that, you know what I mean? To which Snoop Dogg added, It's setting up my album. We're a track and field team. And Tupac replied, we're going to tag team them all day. If there's a tag team around that knows about being wanted men, it's Tupac and Snoop Dogg. Two of America's Most Wanted was written when Snoop's murder trial was beginning and my jail sentence had ended. Finally, Snoop Dogg added, When I wrote it, I was so happy that Pac was out of jail. I wanted people to know what I was thinking about in my case. And I was thinking about him as well, because if they take me away, they got to let him out. You can take one of us, but you can't take both of us. The Two of America's Most Wanted video depicted Biggie and Puffy getting punished for setting up Tupac. Meanwhile, Tupac also released the hard-hitting Hit Em Up, a biting diatribe against Biggie, Bad Boy Records, and any other people who had irked him. By that point, tensions were sky high. What began as a difference of artistic style had morphed into a vicious feud between two factions of the hip-hop community, with personal reps perceived to be at stake. When Pac returned to New York for the MTV Awards on September 4th, he got into a minor scuffle. Rumors began to circulate that he was leaving death row, and maybe rap as well. Perhaps to focus on acting and other personal projects. September 7th, 1996. Mike Tyson and Bruce Sheldon fight at the MGM Grand Hotel in Las Vegas, and Tupac is in the audience. As he was leaving, Pac got into an altercation with an unidentified man. Security broke up the fight and briefly questioned the man before releasing him. No one got the man's name. Later that night, Tupac was a passenger in a car Suge Knight was driving, and they stopped in traffic. Suddenly, a suspect riding in a white Cadillac opened fire on Suge's car, hitting Tupac four times in the chest. Paramedics rushed Pac to the University of Nevada Medical Center, where he underwent surgery which included the removal of his right lung. Tupac spent six days in critical condition. Finally, at 4.03 p.m., September 13, 1996, Tupac Amaru Shakur passed from this world. From the start, Pac's mom, Afini, had constantly feared for her son's life, saying, I never believed he would live to adulthood. Every five years, I'd be just amazed that he made it to five. He made it to ten. He made it to fifteen. I had a million miscarriages. This child stayed in my womb through the worst possible conditions. I had to get a court order to get an egg to eat every day. I had to get a court order to get a glass of milk every day, you know what I'm saying? I lost weight, but he gained weight. He was born one month and three days after we were acquitted. Before Tupac, I had not been able to carry a child. Then Tupac comes along and hangs on. He really fought for his life. He may have left us, but Pac still has a lot to say. Feeling his own murder was likely, Tupac had worked feverishly since his 1994 ambush to create a huge catalog of unreleased work in poetry, music, and video to speak for him, as he said, in the event of my demise. 
In 1997 alone, three Tupac films were released, Gridlocked, Bullet, and Gang Related. Up until his death, Tupac had been hard at work on his latest album. Two months after his death, Death Row released Tupac's first posthumous album, The Don Caluminati, The Seven Day Theory, released under the alias Machiavelli. Rumored to have been recorded in seven days, it topped both the R&B and pop charts and sold over four million copies. Intentionally or not, the Caluminati album contributed to the plethora of conspiracy theories. <laughs>